My name is Dennis McSpadden. I'm the president of Local Union No. 3 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. The film you're about to see is the story of one group of workers, electrical workers, who formed the Brotherhood and pledged to each other upon their sacred honor, their commitment to better their lives and the lives of future generations. It, it is, is a story, story of their, their vision, vision and, and their, their dream, dream for security. security. Their vision, vision then man. and our vision now is the same vision articulated by the founding fathers of these United States. To form a union for the purpose of establishing justice in the workplace, ensure labor tranquility, provide for their common economic defense, promote their general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. Local 3 was born in 1888 in the kitchen of Bill Hogan's mother's apartment in the Yorkville section of Manhattan. Brother Hogan served as an official of Local 3 through the first 50 years of its history. He, along with a small band of brave electrical workers, conceived what was then known as Labor Assembly No. 5468 of the Knights of Labor, which was duly affiliated with the American Federation of Labor. Labor Assembly No. 5468 was affiliated for a short time in the 1890s with the National Brotherhood of Electrical Workers of the American Federation of Labor. It was not until February 7, 1900, that Local 3 affiliated with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Upon this momentous event, Local Union No. 3, IBEW, was founded. It was this founding and this affiliation of 100 years with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers that we celebrate in this new millennium. The members of Local Union 3 have participated in bringing to reality economic security and justice through trade unionism, not only for working people, but also for all New Yorkers. The plots of land throughout Local 3's jurisdiction where any man-made structure stands within the five boroughs of the City of New York and in the counties of Westchester in New York and Fairfield in Connecticut were once barren open fields or wooded groves. Each structure represents someone's dream, someone's vision brought to fruition. Each structure would be incomplete without the touch of a Local 3 member who is instrumental in either the manufacture, installation, or maintenance of the electrical system that makes the project whole. In the process of becoming dream makers, Local 3 members negotiated fair and equitable contracts with their employers. From its inception through 1934, the union represented less than 5,000 highly skilled electricians employed in the construction industry. In its early years, the relationship between the employer and the union was not always on the best of terms. This was evidenced by the 33-month lockout of building trades workers by the employers in the metropolitan New York area. Dear Sir, in reference to the communication sent you on August 2nd, 1904, I am directed to advise you that at a meeting of the Board of Governors held today, it was unanimously decided that unless your men are returned to work on the Trinity Building, the subway, and any other work of members of the Building Trades Employers Association from which they have been withdrawn, that your entire trade will be laid off on Monday morning, August 8th. Signed, William K. Fertig, Secretary. After a general discussion on the subway strike and the arbitration plan, the following resolution was offered that, be it resolved, that we very much dislike the controversy between ourselves and our employers, as the relations existing between our organization and our employers has been of the best, it is our desire to continue such pleasant relations. But through our affiliations with the other building trades, we cannot comply with these requests. It was during this period that the electrical employers declared that they would never sign an agreement with Local 3. Consequently, Local 3 was designated Local 534 from February 1, 1907 until being reissued the number Local 3 in December of 1917. During the Roaring Twenties, there was much internal turmoil within the Union. Fissures existed along every imaginable line, resulting in the international office running the affairs of the local Union from 1926 to 1932. The structure of the IBEW at that time was that you were a local union of the IBEW and you, you had a charter that was granted to you from the IBEW, but the IBEW retained an important control over the local union and they had the authority to come in and take over the affairs of the local union and to operate the local union. And, and a man named Harry Broach did that. 
It was at this time that Emil Priest was elected the first business manager. With the resignation of Brother Priest in 1933 due to failing health, the union faced the possibility of reverting back to infighting. It was the election of Harry Van Arsdale Jr. by the union's executive board to fill the unexpired term of Brother Priest that resulted in the unification of all factions of the union behind one leader. It's first official, like he called one at a time, he called each borough in and he says, look fellas, Local three is an awful shambles. We can get things and we can do things if we all pull together. Right now, everybody is pulling in different directions. And from that time on, things started to happen. It was the beginning of Local 3, IBEW, as we know it today. In the midst of the Great Depression, Brother Van Arsdale set out to organize the entire electrical industry in metropolitan New York. Every facet of the electrical industry was targeted and organized. Manufacturing, service, repair, switchboard, lamp and lampshades, fixtures, newspapers, hotel and cable workers all became members of Local 3 under the IBEW banner. From 1933, when Harry Van Arsdale Jr. became business manager at the age of 28 through 1939, Local 3 grew from a union made up predominantly of skilled inside electricians numbering less than 5,000 to a union of 17,000 members. The largest local union in the American Federation of Labor and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Today, membership is over 30,000. These men and women, members of Local 3, in concert with their union officials and the cooperation of their enlightened employers, have established for themselves and their posterity cradle of grave benefits, high wages, and safe working conditions. For all electrical workers throughout the New York metropolitan area, Westchester County and Fairfield, Connecticut, they have and their employers have been trendsetters in the establishment of labor management cooperation. The establishment of the Joint Industry Board of the Electrical Industry in 1943 was a watershed event in labor relations. The Joint Industry Board basically administers all the plans and benefits that are collectively bargained between local union number three of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and the employer contractors within our jurisdiction. It was born in 1943 and it came out of a couple of different committees and plans that were established in 1939 and in 1935. That was the employment plan and also the pension plan. At that time, the leaders of the industry saw a need for a more comprehensive organization to administer all of these plans. Local 3, with the cooperation of its signatory employers, has established the following firsts as benefits for working men and women in a multi-employer industry. In 1937, under the leadership of business manager Harry Van Arsdale, Jr., it was agreed the employer would pay the full cost of the Social Security tax. This, in effect, established an employer-paid pension for electricians. In 1940, it was agreed to establish the first multi-employer pension plan in the United States. In 1950, construction was begun on the first 2,500 cooperative units of housing, Electchester, a showcase of how workers' pension monies could be put to use to provide affordable housing. The men were coming back from the service, and there was no, not a sufficient uh, supply of adequate housing at, at a fair price and then there was unemployment in the building industry at the same time and no one was coming forward to to build. Also in 1950 electricians received paid vacations for the first time. Dental benefits were established and a convalescent facility for members. Bayberry Land, a 314 acre estate in Southampton, New York opened. In 1954, an individual annuity for each electrician to supplement his or her pensions came into existence. In 1961, a five-hour workday was established. In 1964, the industry became self-insured for the purpose of providing workers' compensation and disability benefits. Following the creation of the Educational and Cultural Fund, a college tuition reimbursement program for members and their spouses was implemented. With the election of Thomas Van Arsdale to the position of business manager in 1968, Local 3 continued to establish innovative benefits for its members and their families. 
This resulted in members receiving supplemental monies in addition to their compensation disability benefits when they were either injured or disabled. In 1970, the Additional Security Benefit Plan was established enabling members to withdraw monies from the plan to meet emergency needs. That's the plan that says when a man is unemployed, he can take money out of that fund. If there's something, and there was during those early days before we had almost complete coverage, there were many things that were medical costs that weren't covered in our plan, but if they had money in that fund, they could take that money and that would be tax exempt money when they took it out to pay for their hospital bills. In 1984, 401k deferred salary plans were established. These were the first 401k deferred salary plans in the nation to cover a multi-employer group. A local three scholarship program grew into the Educational and Cultural Trust Fund's college scholarship program that by year 2000 awarded $13.7 million to members' children since its creation. Such educational endeavors were the genius behind the founding of the Harry Van Arsdale Jr. School for Labor Studies, a component of the State University of New York. The wages, hours, and conditions established by Local 3 were not always won through employer cooperation. In some instances, members sustained long, arduous strikes and lockouts. Some stand out in our history. Others have faded into the past. None are forgotten. To name a few, the Edward Caldwell strikers in the fixture industry in 1934 lasted 13 weeks. In 1938, lamp and shade workers struck for union recognition. 1940 saw the infamous Triangle Conduit and Cable Strike. The Triangle Strike caused the death of one picketer, Carl Roth. 1940 also saw the strike at Leviton Manufacturing Company by some 1,500 workers that was also for union recognition. The First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt, visited the Leviton strikers on the picket line, encouraging them to fight on for union recognition. In 1940, employers of the Holmes Electric Protection Company struck for 13 weeks to better their wages and working conditions. In 1954, there was the 16-week circle wire strike. In 1961, electricians struck for the five-hour day. And in 1977, they were locked out over the long-held principle that during periods of unemployment, construction electricians institute a work-sharing plan. In October 1996, elevator maintenance mechanics struck for 17 weeks in order to maintain their benefits under the administration of the Joint Industry Board. Local 3's officers also bore the brunt of many attacks for their progressive and aggressive stance on behalf of working men and women. In 1940, all of the officers were indicted by Assistant United States Attorney General Thurman Arnold on technical charges of alleged conspiracy, boycott and restraint of trade for attempting to secure work and future work for their members. After lengthy litigation, our officers were found innocent. During the Triangle Strike, business manager Van Arsdale and other representatives of Local 3 were arrested for rioting on the picket line. For that, they too were found innocent. In the 1990s, our officers and representatives were forced to defend themselves in court charges that were brought by employers not under agreement with Local 3 in an attempt to have them removed as officers of Local 3 and to have Local 3 declared not a labor union. Both suits failed and were dismissed by the federal courts after nearly four years of litigation. All through the past 100 years of representing working men and women throughout the metropolitan area, Local 3 IBEW consistently has been at the fore. Never intimidated by the foes of labor, Local 3 has remained ever resolute to the dreams of its founders, the principles of trade unionism, and providing a fair day's work for a fair day's wage. Local 3 members are proud of their heritage and the brotherhood they have created. They look forward to the future. As one looks to the horizon at dusk or dawn or flies into New York in the dark of night, they witness the illumination of the world's greatest city, the world's capital, the Big Apple in its brilliant splendor. The hopes and dreams of individual New Yorkers are reflected in each light, whether it is a long Broadway or a single lamp lighting the path from the curb to your home. Each represents the efforts of Local Union Number no. 3 members to bring into reality the dreams and visions of so many. Each and every usage of electrical power and light bears the stamp of the union label of Local Union Number no. 3 IBEW, the union that does not merely record history, but makes it.